Johns Hopkins Medicine, known for groundbreaking research, teaching, and medical care. Welcome to Facebook Live from Johns Hopkins Medicine. I'm Elizabeth Tracy. And I'm Claire Rock, infectious disease physician here at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Claire, thank you so much for joining me today. This is such a timely visit because, of course, we're entering flu season here in the northern and western parts of the globe. What do we need to know? Absolutely right, Elizabeth. Flu season is starting, and we're starting to see our first few cases of flu and likely going to ramp up very quickly over the coming weeks. The most important message for anybody that's out there listening to this Facebook broadcast is to go get vaccinated. And ideally, being vaccinated before the end of October um, is the ideal time to allow our immune system time to build up its immunity to fight against the upcoming flu virus that's going to be circulating. So we want to get the flu vaccine as soon as possible. The flu season, though, really extends into the spring. Isn't that right? That is absolutely right. So the flu season can persist through April and even through May. Um, where we still see the occasional case of flu. So it really is a long period of time, the flu season. When people think they may have the flu, what are the symptoms that are most common? So the flu infection can be really very varied. It can be from a mild illness to really a very severe illness. Um, it's very different to a regular cold, which is just a runny nose or the snuffles. The flu usually starts quite abruptly, quite suddenly, um, and often people feel um, like they have severe muscle aches um, and pains in their joints um, and often can have fever or a feeling of chills, often have cough, um, sore throat and can have headache. Um, and often or sometimes when people have higher risk factors for more severe um, infection with influenza, it can lead to other complications like pneumonia or bacterial infection in the lungs or in the sinuses or in the ears, uh, which are more serious. We have some medicines that can help with the flu, but don't they need to be taken within a certain period of time? We do have some medicines that are antivirus type medicines that can help fight against the flu, but ideally they need to be taken within the first couple of days of symptoms. So really, prevention is always better than cure. So focusing more on getting the flu vaccine now as opposed to waiting for symptoms to treat is really the best strategy. Well, since you brought up prevention, what are some effective preventive strategies outside of getting the vaccine? So the other things that we would recommend is um, what we call cough etiquette. So really, if you're feeling that you're having a cough or a sneeze, um, to make sure that you're doing that into a tissue, so that there's not the air droplets coming from someone with the flu into the air that could be contagious to another person. So really trying to contain those droplets in tissues. And then we always say the importance of hand hygiene. So that can be alcohol-based hand rub to make sure that people are clearing their hands of any viruses or pathogens, um, or hand washing with soap and water. Of course, we always worry about a flu virus being on a surface. How long can a virus still be infectious if it is on a surface, if it comes from somebody's respiratory droplets, for example? That's absolutely correct. The virus can persist on surfaces. And then if you are to touch those surfaces, those viruses can be transferred to your hands. And if you are then to touch your mouth or your um, nose, or even sometimes your eyes, and that virus can be transmitted to you and you can catch um, influenza virus. And um, so that really is the importance of making sure that we're doing frequent hand hygiene um, and making sure that we're, um, if we are sick, um, that we're not going to, um, with influenza, that we're not going to work where we could be um, transmitting the virus potentially. That's such an important point. If someone suspects they have the flu, how can they be accurately diagnosed? So if someone suspects they have the flu, they should call their doctor's office by telephone. And ideally, anybody that has any high risk uh, conditions for more severe influenza should really be calling their doctor's office as soon as they have any of these, of these symptoms. And the reason for that is, as you alluded to, there is uh, an antivirus medication that can be given in the first couple of days of symptoms. How effective are those? 
The effectiveness is varying. Uh, it's, it's likely that they make the flu virus less severe for certain populations, but the effectiveness is varying, and certainly prevention is always going to be better. We do have a question, and it's one that I think is of interest to both of us and certainly to one of our viewers. Can you get the flu from the vaccine? So this is really a myth. We can't get the flu virus from the vaccine. And so when people do feel that they're having some minor aches after the vaccine, what that is is your immune system having a huge response to inactive flu viruses. And so this is much, much less um, symptomatically than it ever would be if one actually had the influenza virus. It's really your body making those antibodies and priming itself so that if you do come truly in contact with the influenza virus, your body is ready to try and fight it off. Is it okay to treat those symptoms of having had the flu vaccine with things like acetaminophen? Yes, uh, treating the symptoms with things like acetaminophen is absolutely um, fine. Um, if someone was to have a severe reaction, we would advise them to contact their doctor's office or ca call 911 if there was a really severe, unexpected reaction. Uh, but for the aches and pains that we see most commonly, acetaminophen is absolutely fine. So you've told me then that people can expect perhaps some soreness or some other mild symptoms if they get the flu vaccine. What else should they expect when they get a vaccine? Well, there are, um, it's a good opportunity for when people go to their doctor's office for their annual flu vaccine or their yearly flu vaccine to really make sure they're up to date on all their other vaccinations that are really so important. So one that's quite commonly indicated is the pneumococcal vaccination that fights against Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is a bacteria that commonly causes um, pneumonia or lung infections. And so anytime we go for our flu vaccine, it's really an opportunity to make sure that we're up to date on all the other vaccines and preventative medicine that we should be availing of. I think the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, has expanded the number of people who ought to get the flu vaccine. So maybe you would review that for me. Really, it's, is there anybody that shouldn't get the flu vaccine? Um, it's indicated for everybody that six months of age or older um, are indicated to get the flu vaccine. There are certain groups of people that are higher risk that we, is advocated that they really try harder or more, are more likely to benefit from the flu vaccine. And they are younger children, and so those over the age of six months but under the age of about five or six um, are at higher risk and should definitely be vaccinated. And then those that are over 65 years of age, those that are pregnant are also higher risk so of acquiring the flu vaccine. So very important for those people to get vaccinated. And then really anybody with any medical um, comorbidity or medical condition, particularly anything related to the lungs or the heart. So anybody with asthma, anybody with COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or any cardiac or heart conditions. But really the vaccine is indicated for everybody over the age of, of six months. Aren't there different types of flu vaccines? There are different types of flu vaccines. There is um, a shot or injection type of vaccine that people can get at their doctor's office or at their pharmacies. And there is also a, a nasal spray flu vaccine uh, that's available for certain populations um, this year. And so I would encourage people when they're going for their um, vaccine to have that discussion at their doctor's office or at their pharmacy to see which vaccine is best for them. And isn't there kind of a super vaccine for older people? There is, so for those over 65 years of age who may have trouble with waning immunity, there is a specific vaccine for them that should help their immune system protect them for the duration of that lengthy flu season. One of the stories I've been hearing is that this year's flu season is expected to be especially bad, and I think that's based on what happened in Australia. Why does that make a difference in terms of our flu season? Well, interestingly, Elizabeth, even every year, about 10% of the U.S. population gets sick from the flu. And so that's a lot of people. 
what we do is we look at what's happening in the southern hemisphere who have the flu before us here on the northern hemisphere due to the seasonal changes and we can anticipate what we may expect here in the northern hemisphere and looking at what's happened in Australia it looks like we may have a, a particularly bad flu season in store for us. Wow, that's a little bit scary. It is, but again, there are things that we can proactively do to try and help protect ourselves against the acquiring the flu or getting sick from the flu. And that really goes back to all those flu vaccines. Well, you brought up vaccines again. And one of the things that I've been hearing is that this year's flu vaccine is not a really good match for the circulating strains for what we're actually seeing. I'm not sure exactly what that means. So every year, we try and anticipate what types of flu is going to be circulating in that year's seasonal flu. And then the, we try and engineer the vaccine to make sure that we include those types of flu that we anticipate to be circulating and really have to estimate and, and make a, a judgment about what those um, circulating flu viruses are going to be. And so sometimes the match for what we anticipate is going to be circulating and what truly ends up circulating does not match 100%. What we would say though is even if there is not a great match for the virus and the circulating, uh, for the vaccine and the circulating viruses, getting vaccinated still will help decrease the, the severity of illness that, you, that someone may get and so can decrease the number of hospitalizations, um, decrease the number of deaths, and really decrease the amount of time of school and work. So even though it may not fully prevent against the flu, it will certainly make the actual flu symptoms and flu illness much, much, much less severe and milder. Why can't we just go and make more vaccine that's a better match? Ideally, we, we would, but it takes time. So the way that the vaccines have to be grown is in egg culture, and this takes a lot of time. And so it's done in advance and trying to anticipate what circulating virus, influenza virus types we're gonna see. So that's why they say if you have an egg allergy, you should be careful about the flu vaccine. Correct. Although often, even sometimes even those with allergies can get the flu vaccine. So I would really encourage anybody that has an egg allergy to have that discussion at their um, doctor's office. If somebody suspects they have the flu and they haven't been able to get treated within a certain period of time, when should they be worried about their symptoms, worried enough to seek medical care? So I think anybody that has any of these high risk conditions that we've um, discussed, such as the elderly over 65, pregnant, young children, anybody with any medical comorbidities or medical problems who's experiencing these symptoms should certainly call their doctor's office straight away. For the rest of the population that don't fall into any of those categories, if they're having difficulty breathing, um, if they're having extremely high temperatures that are persisting over a couple of days or having a lot of wheezing, then they should definitely call their doctor's office and get advice. How long does, it, or should we worry about getting a second infection when we have the flu already? Sometimes I hear people report that, wow, I had the flu and now I have another infection. So that can certainly happen. Sometimes we get the flu and then that primes us for a secondary bacterial infection. And so if someone has persisting symptoms or, or additional symptoms after having flu-like symptoms for a couple of days, such as bringing up productive sputum or a lot of phlegm from, some, from your chest that's a dark color or greenish color, that could be a sign that there is a secondary bacterial infection and certainly would encourage people to call their doctor's office and relay those symptoms. Let's say I'm lucky enough to catch myself in that window and I do get a medicine to combat the flu. How long is it gonna take me to feel better? It really depends. Um, sometimes people can pick up quickly from the flu and feel better in a short period of time. And sometimes those feelings of the tiredness and the aching joints and muscles and feelings of chills can persist for a couple of weeks. So it really depends on each individual person. Well, you've been incredibly informative. Thank you so much. What else would you like to add? 
I think if, if we haven't made it loud and clear, the message is to try and get vaccinated. And there's multiple places that we can get vaccinated. We have the Johns Hopkins outpatient pharmacies who have the vaccinations. And um, there's doctors' offices, local pharmacies. And so now is the time for us to prepare ourselves for the upcoming flu season. Thank you so very much. Thank Thanks you, for Elizabeth. joining us.